let me first uh, well, join the other speakers in uh, thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here. It's always nice to be back at KITP, and especially for such a nice conference as we're having right now. Um, so today I will be talking about uh, exit on insulators, as my talk suggests. Um, but exit on insulators which spontaneously break a U1 symmetry. So in particular, I will be thinking about uh, systems where the Hamiltonian has on top of the usual charge U1 symmetry an additional U1 symmetry uh, and in such a way that we can divide the electrons into two different species where one species has charge plus one under the additional U1 symmetry and then the other species of electrons has charge minus one an additional U1 symmetry and I will note this U1 symmetry um, as U1V and it acts in the following way then on, the, on these two different species of electrons. Now of course um, this is entirely motivated by Mori systems um, where this additionally one charge would be uh, the valley quantum number, right? Um, and then I want to consider a situation where this additional U1V symmetry is broken spontaneously by the interactions um, because there is an exciton condensate where the condensed excitons carry a non-zero charge under this U1V symmetry, right? So really in Mori language I will be thinking about IVC states, intervalley coherent states. To be completely precise, it will be thinking about systems at integer filling where there's a charge gap as a result of this symmetry breaking. Okay, so from the outset, um, I don't know what's going on there. I don't know why I can see. Uh, okay, seems better. Um, Okay, so it's, uh, let's, from the outset, distinguish between uh, three topologically different classes of such exciton insulators we could consider. And to be concrete, let's, um, in this part of the talk, consider a physical situation where this additional U1 symmetry is a layer U1 symmetry, which means that these two species of electrons just live, uh, really physically live in two different layers. And the first class is a topologically completely trivial class, um, and a representative of that class is just two layers with, where each layer contains a square lattice. And then I have in between this blue thing here, which is meant to represent some thick dielectric, which makes it impossible for the electrons to hop from one layer to the other. Um, and then I can just consider spinless electrons at half filling in each layer, hopping between nearest neighbors on the square lattice. Um, I can also then add some repulsive interaction, and I can add a, a short range interaction where this, there's a repulsion to the electrons in the two uh, and square lattices which are right on top of each other, the these two sides which are right on top of each other. Um, and then I would get these first two terms here, but that's of course just the Hubbard model um, where layer, where spin has been replaced with layer, and actually this has, instead of a layer U1 symmetry, has a full layer SU2 symmetry. Um, but that we can break by adding this nearest neighbor interaction which uh, lowers the SU2 symmetry to a U1 symmetry. Um, and we, of course, know all very well that I have filling. You get antiferromagnetic order. Um, and with this, this additional next near, nearest neighbor interaction, what you get is some in-plane, easy-plane antiferromagnetism. And if U is very large, then we know what happens is we have local moment formation. And the classically ordered ground state um, is a product state in real space, uh, which in the exciton language, um, this layer, uh, with the layer one symmetry, the classically ordered ground state would be um, a product state where the electrons go in a bonding state on one of the two sublattices and then go into an anti-bonding state between the two layers in the other, in the other sublattice. Um, but this is the classical ground state. Of course, uh, in the local moment regime, um, really the low energy physics and the quantum ground state is determined or is dominated by quantum fluctuations of these uh, local moments. On the opposite side of the spectrum, we have the topologically uh, non-trivial case. Um, and there, we can again think about the bilayer system with a layer U1 symmetry, but now the electrons in each layer experience a magnetic field. And I will take them to half fill a lowest lander level. And now my Hamiltonian is the Coulomb interaction projected in these two lowest lander levels. And then the interaction Hamiltonian has this, determined by this two by two matrix, where the diagonal elements tell me how strong is the repulsive interaction between electrons within the same layer, and the off-diagonal interaction, the off-diagonal elements tell me how strong is the interaction between electrons in two different layers. And there it's well known that for small positive alpha v, which makes the 
Um, the interaction between the two layers is somewhat weaker than the interaction within the same layer. Um, again, the system spontaneously breaks the layer E1 symmetry. Um, and these, the electrons occupy states which are in a superposition between the two different layers. Uh, an important difference is that now I have a non-zero Hall conductance. Um, so this clearly tells me that there can be no local moment physics. Um, the electrons clearly have to go in extended states to have this non-zero Hall conductance. And then the third case one can consider uh, sits in between the, these two other cases and is the, the situation I will be considering today. Um, this is where, um, well, and the representative of this intermediate class here is again take a, a quantum Hall bilayer system, but take a time reversal symmetric one. Um, and you again take two half fields, uh, lambda levels. Now the electrons in the top layer experience an opposite magnetic field from the electrons in the bottom layer. So this has a time reversal symmetry which flips the two layers. I can then consider the same Hamiltonian Coulomb repulsion projected into these two lowest lambda levels. Um, and what one finds is that if you tune this anisotropy parameter beyond the critical value, then now you get what, what we call a textured exciton insulator, which also breaks the layer U1 symmetry spontaneously. Um, and I will explain momentarily why we call this a textured exciton insulator. Um, but for now, it's just important to note that this actually, um, this system preserves the time reversal symmetry. So clearly, it must have a zero Hall conductance. And now, actually, there is a possibility to exponentially localize the electrons. So there could be some local moment physics here. But clearly, it's still different from this side here, the, the completely trivial side. Um, because if there are local moments here, they only get formed after we break the symmetry. Here we have preformed local moments. And in these local moments, there's the, the quantum fluctuations. They could order. They could form a spin liquid, whatever. But here we only have localized wave functions after we've broken the symmetry. So this is still, these are two different cases. Um, okay, now let's explain why we call this intermediate thing um, a textured exciton insulator. And for that, I will just, uh, I will go away from the lambda levels and consider, consider churn bands. So I will consider a churn plus one band, a churn minus one band, uh, where each band lives in a different symmetry charge sector of my U1V symmetry. Again, more is set up. I have a churn plus one band in one valley, churn minus one band in the other valley. Um, this happens not only in TBG lined with HBN, but also happens in many other, um, many other Mari materials. Um, and so let's define C dagger plus minus, and these create electrons in the churn plus or minus bands. Um, and then, so both these bands start out being half filled, and then I want to turn on my interactions. I have a spontaneous symmetry breaking, and there's a spontaneous, spontaneous hybridization of these two bands, which creates the gap. Um, and so the exciton insulator is characterized by a non-zero order parameter for the one symmetry breaking, which precisely, uh, precisely measures the coherence between the churn plus and minus one band. It is I call delta, my order parameter. Um, but the important point is actually that um, the topology of the underlying symmetric bands have an important implication for the structure of this order parameter. In particular, the churn number um, implies that this delta must have two zeros in the Brion zone. And the easiest way to see that is to pick a particular gauge such that the C dagger, uh, C dagger plus and C dagger minus, um, they are both smooth, non-singular functions of momentum. Um, but then because of that churn number, their phase has to wind around the Brion zone edge, so the, they cannot be periodic functions of momentum. Um, they have this phase winding. Um, and so this tells me that the C dagger plus, the phase of this object winds by 2 pi around the edge of the Brion zone. C minus also has the same phase winding by 2 pi. So the phase winding of delta around the edge of the Brion zone has to be 4 pi. And so what will happen is this delta k will have two zeros generically two zeros, where the phase of delta k winds by two pi around each zero. And now uh, I claim that this winding tells me that this vector n of k here defined in the following way, and the exciton insulator must form a non-trivial texture momentum space. Um, and so what is this n of k? If you think about it, um, a simple mean field Slater determinant, um, then this tells me ex completely how my state looks like because at every k I have two states, one state for my churn plus one band, one state for my churn minus one band. 
And at every k, this n of k tells me um, what states what, or what linear combination in this Hilbert space uh, I am occupying at every k. So this would be a unit vector in that case. Um, and the x, y in-plane components of this vector, uh, as I just told you, well, this, is like, this corresponds to the IVC part, the, the order parameter part. So the x, y components of this vector field have two, um, uh, have two vortices in the Brillouin zone. And then for this vector field to be non-singular, um, this vector field has to count out of plane at the location of the vortices. So it makes two marons. Um, and so that's, this texture then um, is what gives us uh, this insulator, the, the churn texture insulator, because it's, it's, uh, it's name. Um, one important thing to note is that if you think about the time reversal symmetry uh, as in Mori materials, um, to, uh, if, you want to if you want to preserve that time reversal symmetry, what has to happen is that in one Maron core, uh, the, the vector, this vector n, has to can towards the North Pole, and in the other Maron, it has to can towards the South Pole. This is because the out-of-plane component is odd under time reversal, and so um, if I'm out of plane here, or I, if I'm oriented towards the North Pole here and towards the South Pole here, but this is actually time versus symmetric uh, um, um, configuration. Now, the fact that we have this texture has some important implications for this churn texture, uh, this churn, this CTI, this churn texture insulator. Um, in particular, one can show that because of this texture, there is a minimal amount, there's a lower bound on the quantum geometry of this uh, state. So this low, this this minimal amount of quantum geometry is a direct uh, remnant of the strong topology of the symmetric system. So before we broke this U1 symmetry. Um, and one can also show that there is a lower bound on the on-site charge fluctuations. So this means that um, the CTI can be exponentially localized, but there is an obstruction to having really delta function localized wave functions. So there is, you really cannot confine electrons to like to be really living on just one side. Um, but if you give me an additional set of empty trivial ancilla orbitals, so ancilla, like orbitals living in a, another part of Hilbert space that I hadn't been considering before, then what I can do, I can um, continuously rotate away my wave function from the churn plus one minus subspace and continuously rotate towards these trivial orbitals in such a way that once I've completely rotated away to the trivial orbitals, now I'm delta function localized, and I can actually do this without encountering a singularity in the bands or without encountering um, phase transition. So uh, you can atomically, really atomically localize if you have uh, ancilla orbitals. Um, so this is then, this means that this is a type of delicate topology as, as was defined by these people here. Okay, so I told you what is the CTI, where, where, the, where is the texture. Um, but I still have to tell you that this is a state that you should care about. In particular, can it be the ground state of some realistic Hamiltonian? Um, and we think that the answer to that question is yes. Um, particularly, we did some numerics on this lowest lambda level model that I introduced earlier. So the bilayer system with two half-filled lambda levels with opposite magnetic fields. So this part of the Hamiltonian are already defined. It's a, co a projected Coulomb interaction, this matrix structure here. Uh, but then we also added a dispersive term, so basically periodic potential, in such a way that there's one flux quantum in every unit cell. Um, and then if we can look at the phase diagram of this model as a function of both this anisotropy parameter um, and the bandwidth introduced by this periodic potential. And if both the bandwidth and the anisotropy parameter are small, what happens is actually you don't break the layer one symmetry, but you break the time reversal symmetry and all the electrons spontaneously jump to one layer or the other. Um, but if you make either the bandwidth large enough or you make the isotropy large enough, then we really go to the CTI. Then the system breaks the layer you one, but it preserves time reversal. And if you then look at the uh, NK, this vector field in momentum space that I just defined earlier, then again, in the in-plane components, we can clearly see the two vortices with the same winding. And then at the cores, we really see that uh, this, this, this makes a maron with two cores that are oriented towards opposite, um, opposite poles. Now, what is interesting is actually uh, to ask what happens, like how does it go from the valley polarized or lay, layer polarized phase to the CTI? It actually goes through a coexistence region where both time reversal and the layer one symmetry are broken. 
this coexistence region we actually call the TVP because it starts from the valley polarized one and, it's, and so it would completely lie at the North Pole, for example, this vector field, but then it would slightly cant and would develop a non-zero in-plane component. So we call it um, a tilted valley polarized phase. Um, so to study some of the uh, properties of the CTI and the TVP, it's actually useful to study a low energy continuum model. Um, and this low energy continuum model is the Dirac model. And that's not hard to see. If we take this two band model for the CTI or TVP, um, where this two dimensional Hilbert space is the is spanned by the churn plus one band and the churn minus one band. Um, so the diagonal elements are the dispersions. Uh, this is the dispersion of the churn plus one band, dispersion of the churn minus one band. Um, and then the delta K is the hybridization between the two, the mixing between these two. So this is our, uh, our order parameter. And this, as I just explained, must have these two zeros with the phase winding. Of course, if you then expand to lowest order in K, you get this Hamiltonian. And you see this is a massive Dirac Hamiltonian. Of course, all because of the, K wind, uh, the phase winding around the zeros. Um, now that we know that we can use a Dirac Hamiltonian as a low energy continuum model, we can use this Dirac Hamiltonian to study what happens if I now introduce a real space uh, vortex in my order parameter. So that's then described by this Hamiltonian, then not really important, the detailed form. We can write it down and you can study the spectrum. And what you find is that for the CT, CTI, you find that there are two mid-gap states localized, exponentially localized at the vortex core. Um, there's one, one uh, the, each of these is coming from one of the two uh, gapped Dirac points in the Brillouin zone. Um, and these two are then interchanged by time reversal symmetry, these two mid-gap states. Um, I can then hybridize the mid-gap states, push them into the bulk states. Um, and if I do this in the time reversal symmetric way, then actually what I find is that at the vortex core of the IVC vortex, there will be some 2KN charge density oscillations. So there will be some halo of charge density wave oscillations at the vortex core, uh, where KN is the location. And 2KN is actually the separation between the two massive Dirac points of your CTI. OK. Then this TVP, this intermediate coexistence region, actually is also very interesting. Um, and to see that, um, we will look at the response um, of this, this phase of matter. So what we'll do is we write down the low energy Dirac Lagrangian. Um, it's written here on the, on the slides. Um, and so, first of all, this mu z, which hasn't appeared before, this is just, uh, this mu is labeling the two different massive Dirac fermions I'm getting from the two. Well, I had one at each node, right? So this is the mu z. This, this, these are the two different Dirac fermions. I have the same mass at each of the nodes. So this is the time reversal symmetry, uh, sorry, time reversal symmetry breaking case. This is the TVP, this coexistence region. And I'm also introduced, I also introduced this um, as a two restriction of a veal bind in the Dirac action. Um, I will explain momentarily why I did that. Um, and then this D, capital D is a covariant derivative, has a background gauge field for the charge, uh, the charge gauge field, and also has a, a valley U1 gauge field. And now with this, with this gauge field and with the field bind, it's actually you have this gauge invariance under both conventional U1 charge, um, you, you have conventional U1 charge gauge invariance, but you also have valley U1 gauge invariance. And then if you integrate, if you integrate out the gapped fermions, you get the following quantized terms in the response section. So you get a churn simons term for the charge gauge field, which tells me that, well, this has a, is an integer quantum Hall state. Um, has a uh, quantized sigma xy. But you also have this um, Chern Simons term for the valley gauge field, which is a descendant from, of the gravitational um, Chern Simons term. And it actually tells me that vortices of the TVP actually have fractional statistics. And have, they have the same fractional statistics of uh, vortices in two copies of a P plus IP superconductor. So in a way, one can say that this TVP is actually the first entry in some eightfold way going by the statistics of the vortices um, for IVC states. Okay, that's everything I wanted to say about the CTI. Um, now I want to generalize the story to a situation that can apply to TBG unaligned with HBN. And so the generalization of the CTI in that context, will, I will call it the, uh, the Euler texture insulator, the ETI. Um, and I say unaligned with HBN because in that case, the system has a C2 symmetry and it therefore also has a C2T symmetry. And with the C2T symmetry, um, the bands in a single valley 
of TBG, the narrow bands, um, they're connected by these two Dirac points, which have the same chirality, the same winding. Um, and this actually tells us that these bands have a non-trivial fragile topology, single by non-zero Euler invariant. Um, so there's an obstruction um, to exponentially uh, one-year localizing these two bands. Now, I want to consider a situation where I dope away from neutrality. I want to dope uh, towards minus two, nu equals minus two. Um, and I also want to consider a situation where I'm not just, I cannot just ignore the dispersion of the bands. Um, and there's two reasons for, the, for this. First, even though the bands can start out as being very narrow at neutrality, they actually um, become more dispersive or the bandwidth increases as you dope because of the interaction and induced normalization of the bands. Um, but then also um, some important perturbations such as strain also increase the bandwidth. So I will take the dispersion seriously. Um, and then what I want to do, I now want to take these valence bands of the two different valleys. Again, makes this IVC exciton insulator break the one, so hybridize these bands. And I want to peel off one isolated band. And so um, one thing I should also mention here, spin is a spectator for me. I'm considering, um, ex I'm exclusively considering spin singlet states. So every band is uh, two full degenerate, has a spin degeneracy. So if I can, if by hybridizing these bands, I can peel off a single uh, isolated band, then I can make an, uh, an exciton insulator, a gapped uh, exciton insulator at minus two. Uh, and so the reason I want to only hybridize the blue bands is that like I said, I'm taking dispersion seriously, so these, the, the, the uh, conduction bands of the semi-metal at neutrality, they're high up in energy, and I want to leave these completely empty. So this, this isolated lower band that I want to fill should be made, of, uh, made up um, of the, these lower bands, the lower bands of the semi-metal at neutrality. An important part of the question is, of course, I'm asking whether I can um, peel off such an isolated band while also preserving the C2T symmetry. And it turns out, yes, you can do that. Um, but you again need uh, a non-trivial texture in the IVC. Similarly, as I needed a non-trivial texture to make the, the churn texture insulator. And the easiest way to see that, or to convince you that this is indeed the case, is to consider this uh, toy model, K.P model. Um, this captures all that the it captures the Dirac points and the winding of the Dirac points capture the symmetries. Um, so the small is just the direct sum of two Hamiltonians, each Hamiltonian describing the bands in one of the two valleys. Um, and in the plus value, my Hamiltonian takes the following form. So K is Kx plus I Ky. And so this is basically two uh, Dirac points lo located at K1 and K2 with the same winding. Um, and once I defined, I told you what H plus is, then H minus the bands, well, the Hamiltonian in the other um, valley is basically fixed by the time reversal symmetry. Um, and so by construction, this Hamiltonian has uh, the value one symmetry, the time reversal symmetry, and the C2 symmetry, and it has the Dirac points with the same winding. Okay, so now I wanna take this toy model, which I believe should capture, which I claim captures all the, the important physics. Now what I wanna do is I wanna add a term which first hybridizes the two different values, so it must be uh, it must break the value U1 symmetry, um, and it should preserve C2 and time reversal. And the first obvious candidate is to add a, a TIVC term, uniform term, uh, sigma x tau x. Um, and like I said, I want to peel off a band from these two blue bands here. So what I will do, um, I will just project this term into this blue band subspace. And I get this two band Hamiltonian. Um, on the diagonal, I have epsilon plus delta and epsilon minus delta. So this epsilon and delta define the dispersion of the two different valley, in the two different valleys. And delta tilde here, capital delta, is the projected uh, TIVC term, which will now pick up a momentum dependence. Um, and what you see here the, in the plot, this is a small delta, so the energy difference between the, the bands in the two different valleys. Um, they're degenerate at this white line here. Um, and at this blue region here, then the um, the bands of the plus valley are lower in energy, and in the red region, the, band, the bands in the minus valley are lower in energy. And these dots here with the labels K1, K2, these are the locations of the different Dirac points. 
Now, the interesting thing that, you, that happens is that if you project this, this IVC term, this order parameter in this blue band subspace, you actually see it has these arcs, these lines where it vanishes. This is due to topology. You can, this is really because the, 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 this is because of the Berry phase, um, because you're working with Dirac bands. Um, it's really, it's not hard to see that you will, if we project this constant term, you also get this, you will always get these lines. Uh, they don't have to be here, but they have to be, yeah, they can be um, homotopically equivalent to these uh, lines of zeros here, but they have to be these lines of zeros connecting the Dirac points from the different valleys. Um, where, the, where this, this um, IVC term actually vanishes. Um, so this tells me that this Hamiltonian actually, um, at two points, it's actually still, it's still gapless, it's not an insulator yet, because at two points, mar marked by the, the red crosses here, there's, zero, there's a point where both uh, capital delta vanishes and small delta vanishes. So this means that I still have a degeneracy between the two bands at these two points. So after projecting this term here, I still have two Dirac points between this lower band that I want to isolate and then the rest of the bands. But the important thing is these two Dirac points actually have opposite winding. So by bringing them together, I can annihilate them and isolate a single band. But to do that, I need to add another term. This doesn't matter. You have to add another term. Doesn't matter which one. But uh, this is this is the one that we used, and this actually brings these two arcs together, rewires these nodal lines or arcs or whatever you want to call them, um, so that now these uh, nodal lines connect the Dirac points in the same, from the same valley and you get this configuration for this delta. And now there's no point in the Brillouin zone where both small delta and capital delta vanish. And now I've isolated, I've peeled off a single, well, yeah, I've peeled off a single isolated band which can occupy and get an external insulator at minu equals minus two. Um, and the point is again that you have some texture because you actually have these singularities here. And note that the, the blue bands that I'm using have singularities at the Dirac points, right? But the thing is this single band that I peeled off doesn't see these singularities because of it, it again forms some texture. Um, okay. um, now, the important question that remains is, as for, this, for the CTI, is the ETI a state you should care about? Is this a state? that actually is a ground state of a realistic Hamiltonian or maybe is relevant for experiments. And uh, again, we claim yes, as Sid will explain on Friday, actually the IKS, the incommensal calculus spiral state, which is believed to have been observed in both TBG and TTG, is exactly such an ETI. And actually, yeah, apparently, uh, originally Ali was also gonna talk about this, but I've been informed that Ali could make it, so it will only be Sid, so. Yeah, you have to watch SIT's talk to see why this ETI is important for actually TBG. Okay, so that's, that was it. So let me summarize. Um, texture of exciton insulators arise generically when, generally when you start out from a symmetric system where the underlying bands of the symmetric system have a non-trivial strong or fragile topology. Um, and as you then break the U1 symmetry, U1 value symmetry, there is a remnant of the strong or fragile topology in the symmetry broken state. Uh, and this remnant, this memory of the strong or fragile topology implies that there is no atomic limit, there is an obstruction to really atomically or delta function um, localizing the electrons. There's a minimal amount of quantum geometry and on-site on charge fluctuations. Um, so I discussed only two examples, the CTI, the ETI, uh, and an obvious question is, is this part of a more general theory and what other interesting states are there to be discovered? Um, and so this first paper here, you can find the theory. In the second paper, we actually did simulations on a bunch of Mari materials, and we can actually find CTIs and also TVPs and ETIs and a bunch of um, realistic uh, Hamiltonians for Mari materials. So if you want to know more about that, check uh, the second paper. So thank you. Okay, thanks, Nick, for a wonderful talk. Uh, questions? So thank you very much for the nice talk. So when you say there is, uh, you have a bunch of predictions for Moray systems, mm -hmm. which, um, which Moray systems, in fact, uh, do you expect this to be realized? Well, for example, TBG, the ETI, this is a, the ETI is well, we believe there is evidence that that one is realized. Yeah, the, the but I think but twisted double bilayer graphene realizes some CTIs. Um, oh, we, we, we looked at twisted trilayer graphene. I think it's, it's also there. Twisted double bilayer. We looked at some TMDs. To be honest, we really looked at like 
eight or I don't know, like some, sorry? Which one? Monobilayer graphene, so yes. Mono, like, oh, okay, yeah. so, so you expect it to be pretty general. Uh, and yes, I mean, of this... course, um, a valley polarized phase is always, is not to be excluded, it's a generically competitive state. But uh, many of these viewers have a lot of knobs, displacement field, et cetera, a lot of fillings we can look at. And we actually found a CTI to fear. Yeah. I, it's roughly as generically as generic as the value polarized phase we find. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other question? Oh. So I have a question about the first part of your talk. So like uh, you at the core of the Meron textures, like you have some value polarization which is pointing one way or the other, mm -hmm. right? And based on whether at the two cores they're pointing in the same way or in opposite ways, you have different phases. That's like, right. is there an understanding of what determines whether they're pointing in the same way or the opposite way? Like, what parameters determine that? Well, yes, and there's, there is a clear reason why the time versus symmetric case is, has, takes up a much larger portion of my phase diagram. And actually, thank you for the question because I didn't mention this, but um, dispersion actually plays a big role in helping this CTI to be actually a competitive state. Because I didn't explain, I, this, this is the, the, Maron, the bi Maron texture. I didn't really explain what this is, these floating planes, these floating dispersions here. But this is a dispersion that turn plus one band and the turn minus one band. And if at the location of the vortex there's a clear energy difference between these two bands, like let's say the energy of this turn minus one band is much lower, then it's clear you wanna, you wanna polarize towards that band. But then by symmetry, these are the bare bands, then at the opposite point, uh, will be, the situation will be opposite. So it's like a clear energetic preference for doing this. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. So you uh, told about a system built of electrons in two different churn bands. And one day there is some fractional uh, generalization where you would build excitons of fractionalized anions. Um. Wait, so you want to now... So I, I, want, I, I, I want some anions in place of C dagger and C. Yes. Is it possible? Is there any obstacle to that? Or any you want like to have some composite fermion picture, composite fermion generalization of the story. Mm -hmm. um, uh, very interesting question. I think, let me, t um, yes, I think the answer is yes. I, I don't see immediately any reason why. Of course, there's an additional gauge. I, I have to, I'd have to think about it, but I, on the top of my head, I don't see any reason why that would not work. Um, yeah. Thank you. So I have a question for this slide, maybe after me. So uh, have you checked this for Twister MOT tool? Because I think it just has two trim bands. It's exactly this model, right? Yes, so I think we did. I think we found that there's no, I, there's no, um, there's no CTI there. I forgot to read. Is it either because of band mixing or because it wants to polarize? I forgot. But I think the conclusion for MOT tool was that there is actually no CTI. I okay. think. Okay, thank you. So uh, towards the beginning of your talk, you talked about this uh, model of two time reverse copies of the lowest Landau level. Um, I was just wondering, you know, another possible state in that phase diagram is kind of like two time reverse copies of a composite Fermi liquid. That's right, yes. So do you have any insight into the energetic competition between no, that I think candidate? That would be a very interesting question because I think it has recently been uh, settled that as you increase the distance in the conventional quantum hall by there, there's no real phase transition between two composite Fermi liquids and uh, the exciton state. Mm -hmm. Here, I think that has to, if there's really, if it really, uh, if let's go the opposite way, if it really goes first, if it really, if this is, this, I mean, I, it's not clear to me that this state is now, if you would increase, uh, yes, increasing the layer separations, increasing alpha. Um, so I don't know if you would keep on going along this axis, whether you would stay within CTI. I mean, at some point you have to go, I guess, to, to composite Fermi liquid. So there has to be some phase transition here. Oh, well, okay, again, I don't know. Maybe this could be, okay, I won't make any statements, but it's, it's an interesting question what will happen along this axis. Clearly, you have to go beyond Horsley Frog to understand what's happening there, but yes, I agree, it's interesting. I really don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so can you go to the slides on the feed theory? I'm curious about the transamance term of this omega this term, yeah. Omega term is the U1 value probing field, right? Yes. But you are in the RBC phase, yes. so the symmetry should be broken. So how do you define Yeah, it? I mean, th th there will be some, I mean, there will also be like a, a grad theta minus omega term, like a conventional superconductor, like yeah, lambda. So it's lambda. Hicks, right? Yeah, it's, it's there, it's there, it's, it's, it's Higgs, yes. 
so then this is this term really meaningful? When well, if it would, if you would have, if if you want to have a pair condensate, it would not be meaningful. But you have a pair condensate and you have a deconf remaining deconfined C2 gauge theory, and it's like the same, it's exactly the same way as Kit Tyre's analysis of the superconducting case. I mean, the fact. I think you could have the same Hamiltonian for like a gauged P plus IP superconductor, but then the difference is that this, this, would be, this would be real fermions instead of complex fermions. And that's why you have two copies instead of one. I think it's almost exactly the same. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Maybe just a clarification. So how does this, um, for the IKS, mm -hmm. um, how does it map to these uh, different options? Which one does is does it correspond to the ETI? Is ETI, it? yes, 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 yes. yes. Um, so that corresponds to opposite uh, direction of these uh, to actually getting a skirmion and the. Well, I mean that's or? that's really not um, what. Okay. Um, yes, it will again. So now you have to hide these singularities, and again, it will do that by by making a Maron texture, which like cancel away from these singularities in opposite directions, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are, in our paper we have this, we actually, we, we see in the large regions of the Bremen zone, which actually exactly overlap these singularities, we find that uh, the, the, the IKS is completely polarized in one of the two values. We have these lobes, I don't know if you, if you know about this, but we have these, these mm -hmm. two valley polarized lobes in our, in our state, and these exactly hide these singularities. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So this, this is like the, the yes. core of the Maron. Yeah. Yeah. To confirm, so so you mean no? Even if you have an RKS state, you cannot have a lattice model. Is that is that the claim? Um, I mean, I think okay. What I what I claim is that I can I can this this one band I peel off, which I fill to make the IKS. That's one is trivial. I can exponentially yeah. localize it. But I think if you do this, the singularities are still there. If you do just this construction, what I did is I peeled off a single isolated band, which is trivial, but I still have higher energy bands, which would still have these Dirac points in there, right? Okay. And so these cannot still be, well, okay, it's not clear. Okay, the, the, the C2T obstruction goes away once it's like a four band or like a three band problem, so maybe you can exponentially localize. I'm not, I'm not sure actually, to be honest, but um, what is clear is that you, don't, you cannot just keep this one band that, is, that I know definitely is, is trivial and just keep that one band. Because you need also the higher bands for like to get the Goldstone physics right, and you, you cannot just throw away the other bands. So, okay, uh, yeah. Any, any other questions? Okay, if not, maybe we move to the next speaker. Yes, thanks, Nick. Okay.